mother, and for you who are parents out there, it's just forever the burden and the task and the challenge and the beauty of raising kids is to see them through different phases in life. You always want to get them to the next phase in a healthy, safe way. And you think, okay, they're done with elementary. Phew, next phase, high school or whatever. And you think you're done with something, but no, there's always something bigger. The bigger they get, the bigger the problems. And oh boy, I tell you, you know, I've got teenage kids now and Whew, there are some mountains you just don't want to climb as a parent. So today we're going to face those hard truths. This is the problem. We don't face things because we're afraid to ask hard questions. And today we're going to do that, okay? So whether you're a parent or you're a child of somebody, a victim, anything to do with uh, drug abuse and issues hard like that, come and join our conversation. I've got a brilliant guest tonight, today, this morning, forever, to talk about this um, heart issue. All right, so let me welcome our wonderful guest today, Dr. Carol Maxim, who is an educational and therapeutic consultant and the author of a book called Teens in Turmoil. Yes. Congratulations yes. and welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. That title says a lot, Teens in Turmoil. Yes. Why did you write that book? Well, actually, um, at the time, I was uh, working in a therapeutic boarding school, and I had a mother call about 7 o'clock at night, just beside herself, and she said, she was asking me questions about the therapeutic boarding school. It's clear that it was not going to be the right fit for her son, and she said in this desperate way, isn't there a book to help me? <laughs> and I thought, and I thought, Bing, 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 no, bing. sorry, there isn't. And literally, that was when I decided, I guess somebody better write that book. Hmm, Good I for guess you. Might as well be me. So that was a few years ago. But today, yeah. in this day and age, mm -hmm. whether it's here in Honolulu or in the world, what do you think the situation is? Is it, you know, I hear increasing articles and write ups about these op opioid addictions and, and deaths and horrible, horrible things. What, situ what situation are we really in today with teen drug abuse? Um, well, you know where it's a bad situation. Um, kid, drugs are readily available, literally everywhere, and literally every kind of drug, large and small, really scary and not quite as scary. It's all there. Kids are on <clears throat> medications, which can and are routinely be abused. Do you think it's more so now than it was before because of the accessibility, or is it the type of drug that is so addictive that it's bringing in more problems? Both and. Okay, all right. Um, and it isn't, I, no, I don't have specific data, but I've worked in this field long enough. Yeah, I'm quite sure it's a lot worse. When I first started in this field, nobody was addicted to OxyContin because was it, it didn't exist. Right, exactly. Um, and then when it first came out, it was touted to be non-addictive, and we found that that wasn't quite the way it turned out. Kids were not using prescription drugs because <clears throat> few kids, I mean, they were hardly around, so kids weren't using them. Um, for just a brief description of what ox oxycodone is for people who aren't aware of these drugs. Can you explain it and what the effects are and why they're so addictive? Uh, synthetic heroin. Oh, God. Right. Right. Oxycodone, oxycontin, synthetic heroin. And is it accessible because it's more affordable? Is that why? Or what, is it like the trendy drug? Well, what, why has it gone so out of control? Well, all the above, again. <laughs> um, it is accessible. Um, if if you get your uh, your wisdom teeth out, you may very well walk out of the dentist's office with a prescription for painkillers, and it probably won't be for four. It might be for many more. Doctors are getting much better about prescribing only what is needed, but um, it's out there where all the the factories are, mm. how it all gets to kids is hard to say. One place, and this is something for parents to think hard about, kids will raid your medicine cabinet. Really, huh? And even if you feel quite sure, my kid won't do that, your, your kid's friends might do that and your kid might not even know it. I've certainly heard that story. Well, you brought up a very important part that I wanted to lead into anyway mm. is that Every parent thinks their kid's not the one at fault. It's always the influence of whoever they're hanging around mm -hmm. with. It's the blame game. It's not my kid. How do we get parents to face up to or maybe just acknowledge the possibilities of, of them 
you know, being the one. All right. So you're thinking, for example, it's not it's not really my kid. It's the kids he's hanging right. around with. Okay. Right. right. Well, why is he choosing to hang around with them? Hmm. Because they're the ones doing what they're he's interested doing in doing. Right. Um, right. Nobody is forcing him to hang out with the kids who are doing drugs. But how do you, as as a parent, tell them not to hang out with the friends they choose? Well, you can say whatever you like. It's not what you say. It's whether you can be effective. And the issue is, if you say to your daughter, you may not hang out with them, they're right. naughty. She'll roll She's her gonna, eyes and think, uh -huh. oh, well. And she may say, oh, mom, I'll never do that again. Or she may say, I'll do whatever I please. Right. Um, but you can't affect it. The one thing that I think too seldom parents think about is parents getting together hmm. and making a, a little club, if you want, a little team. Now, you will have parents who won't get on board with you. Right. But most parents don't want their kids using drugs. Of course, right? So if you start it and you say, as parents, how can we get together and work amongst ourselves to see that if kids are partying at your house or they're partying at my house, we both know mm, there's nothing bad going on because we are keeping an eye on it. And if I think I need to drug test my child. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call you so that you will think, hmm, maybe I better drug test my child as well. Okay. So and a team effort to be on track. Absolutely. And yes, I mean, I've had parents say, but not everyone will get on board. That's true. Right, because they're denial or whatever. They right. go, it's not my kid. They'll never but, do that. But most will. Because most feel like you do, and you can say, look, we all want to believe it's not our kid. Mm. So in order to make sure it's not our kid, let's band together. Mm. And let's come up with very similar rules and, and boundaries for our kids. Can you really control that, though? We really don't know. You're not in the room with them partying. And even if you do a drug test, apparently they have these fake mm -hmm. pee. And how do they get these things? And where is all oh. this? You can get anything you want on the internet, or I've certainly known kids that um, would sell their pee to others. Oh, gosh. Yes, yes. Um, one of the best stories was um, many years ago, this kid, his dad was actually a urologist, and the kid oh. presented the dad with a little vial of pee, but it was ice cold because it had been in the refrigerator. Oh, okay. Guess what? The dad yeah, figured think. it out. He did? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. But as far as I know, the very best drug test, particularly on younger kids, yeah. um, not, you know, by the time they're 20, not so much, is when you say, okay, we're doing a drug test. No warning. And you watch your child's face. You know your child. That face is going to tell you everything. Watch the eyes, particularly. Huh. Um, you know your kid. And, OK, whatever. Right. Oh, they I got to go. Come. I don't have to pee now. Yeah. Or it's right. always something, or, right? Whatever. It's going to be oh. clean anyway. <laughs> yeah, I heard that one. <laughs> then you just say, OK, good. I'm really glad. Go do it. Uh -huh. And guess what? No privacy in the bathroom. Yeah. I think Sorry that's... you gave that one up. Right. Yeah. 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 But the best one is just watch your kid, the reaction. You can, you're, mm, let's call it 80, 85 percent of the time, you're going to know. So it's not even the results of the pee test, because they may be smart enough to mm -hmm. have a vial of fake pee in their pocket. Who knows? Sure. But to the reaction you're talking about. That's but it. But you say know your kids, so that's interesting. How much do we really know our kids? And we think we know them, or maybe we're still trying to put the cloak over our own eyes that this is not the kid I want to see. So there's a lot of deception. Absolutely. But if you think back to the kid you knew when he or she was two, three, four, five, six, that's still very much the core of your kid. That doesn't really change. I'm not saying that they don't take on other right. more mature personality traits and they look different and so forth. But that's the part deep in your gut, yeah. you know. And I will tell you, mother to mother, mother's gut, rarely wrong. I think you're right. That instinct is pure. Yeah. But the, the problem comes when your mother's gut tells you something and then you let your head take over. Right, and you don't no, want to go there. Right, it couldn't be, and he wouldn't do that. Yeah. Go with the gut.
Your gut is what's right. Oh boy, I mean, but that again, I think a lot of parents um, just don't want to face up to the possibilities of anything that's going to affect the rest of their lives. So for example, going back to this drug mm -hmm. abuse, addiction is, I'm learning, I hear, is, is a lifelong battle oftentimes. So yeah. when you're saying that kid, that cute little kid from two years old and it's still inside, <laughs> how much can drugs destroy that and will they ever or she ever come back to who she or he really was? Um, yeah, they can really come back. But you will find addicts will always say, I'm in recovery, not I am recovered or I have recovered because they know any day could be the day I lose track of recovery. So one day at a time, and I'm in recovery. Mm. You, so as soon as you think you have recovered, you're treading in, in very dangerous waters. So let me go back to what you're talking about. Parents don't want to know. I get that. But far more dangerous is not knowing. Far more dangerous is just saying, okay, I'll believe that. It makes no sense, but I'll believe it. No, it makes sense, I'll, but I'll believe it. Hmm. You're still hoping. Yes, and a couple of things to think about. If your child is using drugs, he is lying and he is manipulating. Okay. And those are absolutes. Nobody does drugs honestly. Think about it. <laughs> hey, Mom, I'm going to pop a couple of pills, okay? <laughs> right. See, it's not going to happen. Right. So it's, um, it's the lying and the manipulating. And uh, there's another, it's an expression from many, many years ago, the old self-help drug rehabs. It's confusion is the junkie's playground. So you think to yourself, I think I'm a pretty smart person, and I'm confused. I don't get it. You said you were there, but I know you were there, but then you said you did that, and, and I'm not getting this. As soon as you feel that confusion, figure out somebody's trying to confuse you. Hmm. And the reason you're, somebody is trying to confuse you, that's lying and manipulation. If I can get you wondering, well, was it 12 or 12.15 he came in? Well, I thought it was 12, but maybe it was 12. No. I don't. As soon hmm. as you're thinking that, you're not thinking about so where was he and what was he doing and why didn't I drug test him? Right, but to be translating to his own behavior, um, if he was lying, obviously there would be some truths mixed in with the oh. manipulation, which makes it very confusing, and you want to trust those truths uh, because there may be moments of it, and that's just what goes, spirals out of control. Now, yes. we've just, I think we've entered an area where we need to kind of pry open a little bit more. Okay. But we will take a quick break. And, and parents really have a deep thought about maybe what you haven't or dared not see about your child's behavior or the influence around or how they are lying or manipulating. I love that. What did you say? Confusion is a junkie's playground. That is just a very confusing and thought-provoking. It is. It's topic. Okay, so put that in your head because confuse yourself. This is good. We got to bring out the dirt so we can really uh, get to the issue. All right, so we'll be back in a quick thing. Don't go away. Aloha. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. What is a way to kind of maybe get parents to, well... You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world. You can beat the war. You could talk to God go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up. You can be you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself.
So we're back here on Quag Talk. I'm talking to Dr. Carol Maxime about, you know, long-term effects and how parents have to face up to hard truths of uh, drug abuser teens. And we were talking about how drugs uh, you're going to be lying and manipulating. Absolutely. This is just a part of the package. Absolutely. And so within that truth, and if a parent does um, have to confront, it's bubbled up, and it's and sh that per the, the parents are working with the kids. How do they heal? How do they even start the process? Okay, so let me backtrack that okay. just a little bit because we were talking about confusion is yes. the junkie's pleasure. I'm all confused now. I don't even know how to ask the right <laughs> questions. Okay, so um, one of the main manipulations to listen for from your child is. You don't trust me? Hmm. As soon as you hear that, you know you should not be trusting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a given. Wait, but if they say, trust me, Mom, you're supposed to trust that too? No. Or don't trust anything. <laughs> no. Remember, trust is always earned. Hmm. And it takes a long time to earn trust and can be lost in the blink of an eye. So the first time you catch your child in a lie, your trust should go to zero. Not down one notch, but to the bottom, because if there's one lie, I'm really sorry to say this, but there's probably another one, and another, and still another, and another. So you don't ever help your child by believing lies or trusting when, you sh when your gut is mm. telling you no. Mm. And you take, by that you mean to take away all their privileges until they earn it back? Yeah, you know, the taking away privileges thing is, is always a bit of a bumpy road, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, because you're going to say, yeah, but I want him to have the phone because I want to know where he is. <laughs> I would, however, want to remind you that because you call him and he picks up the phone, you don't know where he is. You don't. You just know that he picked up the phone. Right. Okay? And he could very well be saying, oh, yeah, I'm at Joe's house when mm -hmm. they're in a bar. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so it's more that before things are given, they need to be earned. Mm -hmm. Privileges need to be earned, not given then taken away. Hmm. Hmm which is hard for I parents so. listening in because they're thinking, but I've already given him this and this and this and this. <laughs> so, okay. But what one thing you can do, first of all, I, I always tell parents, don't ground your child. Uh -huh. Doesn't Why? work, huh? Well, number one, it doesn't work, and number two, who's really suffering? You are. But I was going to ask grounded you. Too. Right. But this is a different generational parenting technique, yes? When I grew mm. up, my mother grounded me all the time. Whether it worked or not, that's another story. But today, a lot of people are so open to communication. Oh, I'll let you go, and then you come back safe and sound. Mm -hmm. That's okay. We Just mm -hmm. talk to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you think that type of parenting is almost open? opening up too much, that's why a lot of these issues are coming in now? Or? Of course. Okay, so let, let's just clarify a couple of things. Okay. As a parent, your job, your, your duty, I don't like the word job, your duty is guide, direct, and educate. Not be friends, <laughs> not be hangout buddies. Right. And I guess I have to say this, no, it's really not a good idea to smoke up with your kid. It really isn't. <laughs> Darn, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you remember that you're, you have a duty to this child, and those are your duties, it becomes clearer. If you use the word duty instead of job, you get into a different mind space. Because you have your job, whatever you do, you're a doctor, a lawyer, a merchant, whatever. Um, that's your job. You have a duty to your child, and your duty is to protect. Yes. And part of that is protecting your child from making really, I'm going to use the word, stupid and dangerous mistakes. Mm. And that may mean saying, you know what? No, you're not going out. Now, if can you give an example of a, a stupid incident that maybe just create alarm bells to people who don't think that this really is going to possibly affect their lives? Have you seen cases? Well, okay, here's one. Okay. I've heard this one about 11 billion times. Okay. Um, you find drug paraphernalia in your kid's bedroom. Oh, that's not mine. <laughs> that's my friend's. Of course. No, it isn't. It's it's really and truly, honestly, your kids. 
Okay, I have never, I've been doing this for a quarter of a century. Have I ever found a time when it actually belonged to the friend? No. So let's just go with that. Right. So that's the kind of thing where don't believe, don't, don't try to trust. I want to trust my yeah, child. Yeah. No, you don't. Trust is earned. So when someone says, I want to trust my child, I always say, but why? So you don't give them the benefit of the doubt because no. they don't have the capacity to Correct. be responsible in that way. Correct. You what, don't. And they're risk-taking age where that's, that's kind of correct. what they're correct. living off of. Right. Because, I mean, adolescents, we've all been adolescents, yes. so we can think about it. I can't be harmed. I can do anything. The world is my yes. oyster, all that. So when your child is making these dangerous decisions, he or she is coming at it from that perspective. So not thinking, hmm, but if I do this, it really could affect my schoolwork, and my schoolwork could affect where I go to college, and that could really affect what I do next, yada, yada. Hmm. I could, no. No, that it's because not it's, it's not part of the adolescent thinking. Right. It doesn't work that way. So are you saying that adolescents really don't have that capacity to think truly responsibly for themselves, and that is why we need to control their I'm saying it, it is growing. And hopefully by the time they're 18 or 20, it's really pretty much right there intact. But the more you enable your child, the more you infantilize your child, the more you help your child to do things that he or she can do on his or her own, mm -hmm. the more you're delaying that maturing process. So the danger of letting them go out freely too early mm -hmm. is really bringing in all the trouble. Yeah, I think of it this way. As a parent, if you are checking on your child's homework, well, what do you have tonight? Well, I checked online, and you really have this. Okay, you're, you're micromanaging the mm -hmm. part of life that your child is able to manage mm -hmm. and should manage. Right. And you're giving your child immense freedom to go out heaven knows where, yeah. doing heaven knows right. what. Right, right. The, the, it's, it's just backwards because your child is able to do seventh grade, eighth grade, tenth grade homework and, and keep up with the assignments without you doing it. If you start getting in the midst of that, you're teaching your child, yeah, you really can't do this. Mm. You're, and you, you're really not capable. And the more very important point, the more a parent or parent micromanage, want to know every little mm. detail. Yeah, the helicopter mom. Right. The more your child's going to go underground. Uh -huh. And if you are managing to micromanage the, um, all their schoolwork and what they eat. Right, you're breathing down their back. That child is going to go underground in the first place. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So you're talking about the overprotective parents who really want to hover and really think they've got everything yeah. in control. But how does a parent know when the kid is in trouble? Like they know there's a serious problem. I mean, we've been through all the deception mm -hmm. and we think there's hope, bullshit. How does a parent know when there is a huge problem before something really bad happens? Okay, so you just used the word hope and I'm going to be a real snark and say, Get rid of your hope. Because I hope my child is not using drugs. <laughs> not I'm sorry, it's yeah. not gonna do it. Right. Don't hope. You have to you have to be active. And remember, once again, your child earns privacy. So uh. if your child says, Don't you, pardon me, effing go in my room? Right. Uh, that means go in my room uh, because right. why? Yeah. Now, but you see, then you, you've got this thing. You've, if you're if you're micromanaging, if you're helicoptering, your child is going to try to find some place that is mine, all mine, my personality, myself, and that is age appropriate. But not if that becomes the only way to get around you mom or dad or parents is to go underground. Yeah. They're going to do it anyway, no matter what you do. They try, are. Right? So you would much rather have your child not turn in homework and lie about that than lie about using drugs. Think about it.
I'm still confused, Carol. I mean, in our short time left, on one hand, we think we should not let that whole leniency open up to the over-communication and saying we're friends and tell me what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. That brings in trouble. At the same time, we don't want the hovering kind of parent who's going to uh, micromanage and, and look at every little aspect of their lives. And so how does a parent find that healthy medium? Guide, direct, educate. Okay, so I, I will say I have never yet met the child who didn't do drugs because he or she was educated about drugs. They know as much as they're going to conceptualize in adolescence that drugs can be dangerous, but not me. I'm never going to get hooked. Mm. But if, if you're micromanaging, you're not guiding, mm. you're not directing, you're not educating, mm. you're micromanaging. Yeah. They are different. And yes, <clears throat> I am saying in many ways, you do have to change your parenting style. And you do have to have rules in the house. I don't like to call them rules so right, much. But I like to call them need. standards. What is, what's okay to do in our family, in our house? And that, that is for parents to make the decision. And frankly, there's way too much negotiation with kids. You set the standards, and those are the standards. If you do it early, if you do it thoughtfully, you're not going to get as much pushback. If, and this is hard, because I know there are parents who are listening, they're thinking about, what do I do with my 17-year-old, and how am <laughs> I supposed to? He's already out of control. Right. right. Um, if he's already out of control, you've got, you've got to find the pull control. Back. You've got to pull it back and try, if you can, to use the school to help you. Some schools will help you. Right. You need Many the whole community won't. of support. Yes. But my gut also is, you know, kids want to have that boundary. Most when you do. don't yes. have that, they're like, something's wrong. It's like parentless, and they feel almost lost at something. It, it's, right? why, it's why kids will leave little traces around. Yeah. Um, or they'll have that conversation on the phone when you're just close enough to hear. Or they'll leave their phone around, and it's hmm. not it's not turned off, so you actually they're could subtle. check the text. Yeah. They're, very often they need us they want us around they do they just we they just say they don't because they're teens yes um, Carol in our short time left I, I also want to remind people mm -hmm. of the, the, the wonderful book that you wrote mm -hmm. um, I want so if people have more uh, questions maybe mm -hmm. they can look it up teens in turmoil mm -hmm. a path to change for parents adolescents and their families mm -hmm. um, it's it's a very hard subject to deal with nobody like you said wants to confront these issues what are some um, hard facts or questions you want to leave our listeners to contemplate about this whole problem? Well, I think the most important one is I get that these, are, these facts are hard to face. But what I want parents to think about is how much harder it is to face it when the facts are bigger, badder, worse. Um, Having that real heart-to-heart -heart and putting in the standards when you think your kid is uh, smoking some marijuana, it's one thing. When you got to come in and say, uh, what about what's going on now, and it's actually cocaine, mm. or it's crushing Adderall and snorting Adderall, these are bad things. You want to get in there early. And um, another point I guess I can't leave without saying, um, kids really like ADD drugs, yes. um, but they're not using them exactly properly. Um, they're crouching them and snorting them, or they're <sighs> selling them to get the other drug that they personally prefer. So think about it. If your child was not ADD as a little kid, he didn't catch ADD now. It's <laughs> not like measles. You can't catch <laughs> ADD. So, um, and kids go on the internet routinely, memorize all the, the different symptoms, go into the psychiatrist, recite them, get the prescription. Mm. 
So we have responsibilities as parents to learn about all these drugs out there, all these crazy, um, it is an epidemic, honestly. Yes. I mean, it, it just really is the tip of the iceberg that we haven't mm -hmm. addressed enough. And we hope today that, thank you to Carol, that we've actually mm -hmm. touched on the, the significance of this bad mm -hmm. influence. And I hope you will really take it to heart and really try to be a community with people who are uh, in need of this. So again, Carol, thank you so much for your oh, wealth pleasure. of advice. And, um, um, I'm very glad to do it anytime. Uh, the more kids we can help, the better we are. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And you guys have a great day. Thank you.